to go ahead and get started. It's right at 7, 701, and uh, it's good to see you in the house of the Lord. We're glad you're here. Um, glad you chose to be with us today. How are you, Israel? How are you? It's good to have you with us, and uh, we're excited as to what the Lord's doing. We want to go to the Lord in prayer. I have left my prayer book. I, this, is, I, this is the second time this month I've left it on my desk. Uh, so we're just going to go from memory. Um, I will write them on the back of my uh, card here, and uh, I'll transfer any new ones when I look. So we're going to remember Linda Pierce. Have they transferred her to rehab yet? Yeah. Where at? Okay. Okay. So we need to continue to pray for Linda um, Pierce. Um, we need to continue to pray for Debbie Um, anyone else have any prayer requests? Yes. yes. So it's a procedure on what? Okay. Thank you, Gina, for the getting that for me. I, uh, so Linda Pierce, um, Kim Martin, Debbie Grigger, uh, Connie Story's family we've been praying for. Um, we need to remember uh, Jetta. This is a young, uh, I say young lady, she's, she's a little younger than me, so she's young, but she's married to Gina's cousin, and they diagnosed her with cancer. Um, they were doing some tests to find out. She has been told that there's nothing they could do for her. Uh, they won't do surgery. They won't, they won't give her uh, chemo or radiation. They're going to give her a little pill, they say, and if it'll put it into remission, then she might have six years. But we serve a God who's bigger than what the doctors know and are, and so we're going to continue to pray for Jetta need to continue to pray for Ronald, a friend of mine who's recovering from a stroke, uh, Leslie Clark family, Doug and Gina Anderson. Continue to pray for Sister Denise, um, Bill and Esther, the loss of their son, Steve Mahale. Uh, we need to continue to pray for Sister Lynette. Uh, she's supposed to have, I think, surgery on her hand tomorrow, so we need to remember her in prayer. Any other prayer requests she'd like to make known? Yes. Any other prayer requests you'd like to make known? I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. And we're going to pray over these. If you have an unspoken, if you just lift your hand for an unspoken, we'll remember those as well. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, we thank you and we praise you and we honor you and we glorify you. Lord, we invite you into this place, your presence, Lord. We worship you and we exalt you, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we lift up these needs and these requests in the name of Jesus, Lord. God, we pray, we call out these names, Lord, uh, on behalf of their need. Lord, we pray for Sister Linda Pierce in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, as she's recovering. God, that you would touch her body and give her strength. God, as she is rehabbing in the name of Jesus, Lord, we pray for Sister Connie's uh, granddaughter and her family, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, that you would you would touch her and, and heal her body in the name of Jesus, Lord. We just pray for Jetta, Lord. The doctors have given her a word that is discouraging and hopeless, but Lord, there is hope in you because you are our healer and we speak healing over her. We pray for Ronald in the name of Jesus, Lord, as he's recovering from the stroke. God, that you would reconnect those broken uh, passageways of uh, connectivity in his brain, Father. Lord, we pray for the Leslie Clark family 
in the name of Jesus, Lord. We lift up Brother Doug and Gina Anderson. Lord, we pray over them, Father, and we speak life and healing and health in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord God, we just lift up Sister Denise uh, in Jesus' name, God, as she is healing from uh, this situation. Lord, we pray for Sister Debbie Grigger, Lord, that you would touch her, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. God, we pray for Bill and Esther and, and the situation that they're faced with, the loss of their son. Lord God, that you would comfort and bring peace to them, Father. Lord, and, and in, in, in the only way, the only one that can, Lord, to bring peace in a situation like that, we pray for Steve Mahale, Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, that you would speak life and healing and health over him, Father, in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray for Sister Lynette and her hand, Lord God, and the surgery that's scheduled, Father. Lord, there'd be no complications, Father God. Lord, that you, that you would see a quick recovery, Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we pray, God, for Kim Martin, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, Sister Robin's sister, God, and, and what she's dealing with in her carotid arteries, Father. Lord, God, you know the situation, and we speak healing and health over her, Father. In Jesus' name, God, we lift up Connie, Sister Verna's friend right now. In the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, that you would touch her, Lord, as she's battling cancer. Lord, we know that you are our healer. Lord, God, for these, these unspoken requests by the uplifted hands, Father, we pray over them in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we just speak and declare your word of truth and righteousness, of healing and deliverance and health in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you that we can come to you, that we can stand and boldly proclaim your truth and life and health and healing in Jesus' holy name. And we give you glory and honor and praise. And the church said, amen. amen. If you have tithe or offering you want to bring it this time, you can bring it and set it on the altar over here. And uh, any loose, undesignated uh, tithe or uh, offerings will go to, um, I believe this was a World Missions Wednesday. And so that's where it will go. Um, we want to pray over our uh, 2020 initiative. If you have a card or you'll take out a card, um, we have some still at the back. This next level prayer agreement. You know, in the Bible, when it talks about uh, being in agreement or being in one accord. Um, we talked about it Sunday morning in, in the message that I preached, but uh, there's a passage in Scripture that says a two, two-fold strand uh, uh, is strength, but a three-fold strand is not easily broken. You know, the more layers you add to something, the stronger something is, the better something is. And when we agree as a, a group of believers... And we can set aside the things that separate us, that we differ on, and we can focus on the things that we agree on. God can move in that. I'm going to tell you, God can move in your life if you have someone agreeing with you in faith. And so that's what we're doing. I know I say this every Wednesday night, but that's what we're doing here. We're agreeing together. We're agreeing for our, our church. We're agreeing for our families. We're agreeing for our, our nation. We're agreeing for uh, the things that are taking place and affecting our children. Uh, we are agreeing that God is going to be God in the midst of those situations. Amen? So the first thing we're going to agree on is that the WCC family would engage in next level vision of Philippians 3 and 14. I press for the, toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of Christ Jesus. I press toward the goal for the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I'm pressing toward the goal. I'm pressing toward that, that which I have set my eyes on the prize. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm ready for Jesus to come. I'm ready for Jesus to come. I've been telling it, I, every opportunity that I've had, I've been sharing this. I believe it. Um, you know, we're th this much closer because I don't think I, I'm, I, don't think I said it Sunday, but uh, this past week I, saw, I read a news article where they have shipped five red heifers to Israel. Anybody know the significance of that? Just raise your hand. Okay. Israel, in the Old Testament, God gave Moses, a, 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 I won't say a recipe, but a recipe for the waters of purification. And in all the sacrifices, it was supposed to be a male ram, a lamb, 
whatever, but female offering was never done, except for in this one, which the, it was called the ashes of the red heifer. And they would take a red heifer without blemish, without a white hair, not one white hair, and they would take her outside the camp. They would kill her. They would uh, uh, do what they needed to do, and then they would burn her completely whole. Then they would take the ashes of that, and they would put it in this this is not in Scripture if you go looking for it, but it's in Jewish writings and historic writings. They would put it in what this, they called the kalile, where they kept this water. And it was a, 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 a jar that was considered sanctified and uh, purified uh, because it held the waters of purification. Now, the important thing for you and I to understand about the waters of purification, and yes, this is about prayer. The important for, thing for us to understand about this is before... Aaron or his sons or any of Israel could worship God through the tabernacle in the wilderness, they had to be purified. They had to be purified by the waters of purification. Okay? Well, since 70 AD, Israel hasn't been purified. They haven't been able to offer animal sacrifices. They haven't been able to offer worship Jehovah like they did in the Old Testament. See, they're not under the same covenant we are right now because we accept Jesus Christ and we don't offer any more sacrifices. But they, st- they don't think he was Messiah yet. And so they've, for, for several decades now, they've been looking for a red heifer. Several years ago, probably about 15 or 20 years ago, um, they found two red heifers in Georgia. The main rabbis flew over from Israel Went to the farm in Georgia. I remember when it happened. It's probably been 20 years. They inspected these two red heifers. I mean, they went over them with a fine tooth comb, literally a fine tooth comb and a magnifying glass, looking for a white hair, looking for some kind of blemish under the skin or on the skin. Couldn't find it. They certified these two heifers as being pure and acceptable for the burning of the ashes. They were getting ready to ship them out the next day. They went to their hotel. They woke up the next morning and two white patches, one on each heifer, appeared. It wasn't God's time, see? Okay? I mean, they, they thought they had found this. This last week, they shipped five red heifers that have been certified pure from somewhere in Texas to Israel. Now, what that says to me is they're getting ready to reinstitute temple worship, which we know is is either a forerunner or it is the time of the tribulation because there's one more temple that's going to be built and that's going to be the tribulation temple built by the antichrist for israel to bring them into a a a treaty and then he's going to break that i learned something today because you know the bible says that there are going to be signs in the heavens talking about the return of christ there's going to be signs in the heavens rosh hashanah anybody know what that is Rosh Hashanah is a, the head of the new year in, in uh, Israel. It's the start of their new year. It's September 26th this year. It always falls somewhere around there. But w- what's interesting, and then in, uh, I think f- five, ten days later, is the high holy day in Israel, and it is Yom Kippur. It's a day of atonement, okay? So they've got a lot of things going on in these next few weeks in Israel. Significantly to me, I believe, I haven't read this anywhere except what was taking place, I read it from NASA, is Jupiter is going to be in opposition. Anybody know what that means? It means on, Jan- or, uh, on September the 26th, Rosh Hashanah, Jupiter is going to be rising in the east at the exact moment that the sun is setting in the west because it's called opposition because it's, it's in exact opposition of, of the sun, but, and the earth is between them. Another interesting thing is this, it, it has not been as close to the earth as it's going to be this coming Monday or Tuesday in 59 years. 1969 was the last time it was this close to the, the earth. It, it, yeah, I'm going to tell you how close it is. It's going to be 300 and I think 327 million miles from the earth. Now, that doesn't sound like it's close. At its farthest point from the earth, it's over 600 million miles away. So it's pretty close. NASA says if you look at Jupiter, if it's a dark sky, if you look at Jupiter uh, in that, that night with good binoculars, you'll be able to see its rings and the stuff that's around it. If you have a large telescope, you'll be able to see the large red dot 
and some of its satellites, its moons. That's how close it is to us. Hasn't been this way in 59 years. Now, that in and of itself is just a celestial thing. But coincide, to me, coinciding with everything that's happening this week and next week, I'm not saying Jesus is coming, but I'm telling you, you better pay up and pray up. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I believe it could happen. I, I really do. I'm, I'm excited. I, I'm looking. I'm telling everybody. I told them in staff meeting tonight. I'm telling you before we go to prayer. Why? Because we need to do everything in our power to make sure we're ready and those around us are ready for the return of Jesus Christ. Because he's coming. He's coming. Now, if you go running down the street saying, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, they're going to think you're a nut until he comes. Until he comes. That's the prize. That's how I got on this. Because the first thing we're going to pray in agreement is that we are pressing toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Will you agree with me? Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, whether, whether you're coming next week or next year or in the next decade or in the next 100 years, we don't know, but God let us press toward the goal for the prize of the upward goal of call of God in Christ Jesus let us be fo focused on you let us be focused on your kingdom purpose and direction and, and, and God let us not be distracted by the things that that could so easily beset us and cause us to go off track but Lord to focus on you and to walk according to your will and your path Lord, to reach and press toward that goal, toward that upward, that prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Lord, I pray that we at Walnut Creek Church would be found as good stewards and good servants. Lord, faithful servants doing your will and fulfilling your purpose in your kingdom, Father God. Lord, pressing toward the goal, pressing toward the prize, Father. Reaching toward that prize in the name of Jesus Christ as we work together in your kingdom to see your kingdom come to fullness and fruition in Jesus' name. Amen. Next, we're praying for the spirit of grace and supplication to bring repentance and revival to the hearts of our WCC family. Zechariah 12, 10 through 12. Father, in the name of Jesus, we're praying for a spirit of grace and supplication. God, upon those who know you and upon those who don't know you. Lord God, for, for repentance and revival. Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord, for our families and for our children and our grandchildren and our, our loved ones and those we care about, Lord, for our neighbors, God, and our, our friends and those that we work with, Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord God, as time is drawing short, let us not be asleep, but let us awake and let the spirit of grace and supplication bring a, a move of, of repentance and revival upon your church and upon your people, Father, that we might awaken and sound the warning and be a clarion call, God, of repentance and revival to those who are in need. Lord, we just, we just pray, God, that you would stir our hearts in the name of Jesus Christ. Next, we're going to agree for lost souls to be added to the kingdom. John 3 and 17, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God didn't send his son to condemn us. He sent his son to save us. Amen. Aren't you thankful he didn't come condemning? You know, there's a difference in conviction and condemnation. We need conviction. Condemnation is going to come when it's all said and done on those who did not get right with him. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord God, we know that you came to seek and save that which is lost. And Father, Lord, we pray, God, in the name of Jesus Christ, that our hearts would be tender toward the lost. God, that we, that, that we would see souls uh, added to the kingdom through our, the ministry here and, and, and through the people here and through, uh, through all the outreaches and all the different things that we do, God. Let our focus be to reach the harvest, to reach the lost, God, in the name of Jesus Christ. Because your purpose and your will was, was that you sent your son to, to seek and to save that which is lost, God, that the world might be saved through him. Lord, we thank you, God, and we praise you. We exalt you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Next, we're, believing, uh, we're praying for believers to be baptized in the Holy Ghost, Acts 2, verse 17. 
Hallelujah. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we need an outpouring of your Spirit in this last day. God, the latter day rain to pour out upon your sons, our sons and our daughters. Lord, God, that they would prophesy. Lord, that they would speak with tongues. God, that they would uh, demonstrate and, and bear the fruit of the Spirit. God, that they would walk in boldness and in truth, speaking that truth in love, Father, under the unction and anointing of the Holy Spirit who empowers us to be a witness for you, God. Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray, God, for the baptism of the Holy Ghost, Lord, to fall on all who desire in the name of Jesus Christ. We give you glory and honor and praise. Hallelujah. Next, we're praying for workers to enter the harvest, Matthew 9, 37 and 38. Turn to somebody and say, come on, let's go. The fields are white. Come on, let's go. The fields are white. Come on, let's go. No one's going to get this in if we don't get it in. Uh, how many know what tomorrow is? Another hot day. That's what tomorrow is. It is the first day of fall, but in Texas, that don't mean a thing. It, it really doesn't. We may break a record, but I'm going to tell you, summer's coming to an end. Spiritually speaking, summer's coming to an end as well. One of the saddest verses to me in Scripture that says is summer has ended. Summer has passed. The harvest is not end, and we are not saved. You and I understand that not everybody's going to heaven. That's just the reality. Not every, everybody's going to make it. But I want to tell you, I don't want it to be because I didn't tell them. I don't want it to be because we didn't share the message. They have to make their own decision, but that's, their, that's on them. I want to be able and, and, and have the, the, the passion and the burden to share the message of the gospel. I want to be a worker in the field. Father... In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray that you would send forth laborers, God, to work alongside us in the fields. Lord, to bring in the harvest, God. Lord, in Jesus' name, soul winners. Lord, to go into the harvest and reap the harvest, God. Lord, they're, they're, the fields are, are full of a ripe fruit, of a ripe grain, of, of souls that are ready to be harvested. Let us enter to the field and, Lord, thrust in the sickle and reap the harvest in this season, in this day. Send forth laborers. Let us be among those laborers in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Next, we're praying for church leaders to have wisdom to know what to do in the season that we're living. First Chronicles 12 and 32. I think everybody needs to have wisdom to know what to do in this season, in this day. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray for wisdom. And I pray for wisdom upon our people. I pray for wisdom upon our church our church leaders, our elders, God, uh, all those associated with our church and their family and their friends, Lord, to recognize and be aware and to know what to do in this day, in this season. Lord, we just exalt you and we praise you, God. Lord, give us wisdom. You, you say in, in the book of James that if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives liberally. Lord, I pray for wisdom. God, I ask for wisdom for myself. I ask for wisdom for these who are here to know what to do. For those who are watching online, to know what to do in this season, in this moment that we're living in Jesus' name. Next, we're going to agree that, that we here at WCC would abide in Him and His words abide in us. If you have your Bible, maybe you have a Bible app. I want you to take it, whether it's your phone or your, your Bible. And I want you just to put it on your chest. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, this represents the Word, Your Word. This represents your, the truth, Your truth, God, which is the truth. Father, this represents the way because Jesus was the Word made flesh. God, I pray that we would abide in You and Your words would abide in us. In the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, we're living in a day where there's deception and deceit, Lord, concerning your word and concerning those who are supposedly speaking your word. God, let us have ears with, of wisdom and understanding and, and knowledge of your word. God, that we are not deceived. And God, we are, we are not uh, led astray, God, but we know your word and we abide in you and your words abide in us, Lord, because in those moments you have said that we can ask what we will and it will be done for us in the name of Jesus Christ. 
Lord, we abide in you. Help us to abide in you and your words abide in us. In Jesus' name. Next, we're going to agree that the WCC family would grow spiritually, physically, financially, and numerically. 3 John 1 and 2. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, I pray, God, that we would grow. The seeds have been planted. Lord, the, the, the water has, has been poured out. The sun has warmed the, the, the spiritual ground. Father, produce seeds of life and seeds of blessing and seeds of numbers and seeds of finances, uh, fruit of finances and fruit of numbers in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we declare it and we proclaim it in the name of Jesus God, that this church would grow and abound in you, God, as we do the work of the kingdom, in Jesus' name, amen. Lastly, we're going to pray that we worship him in spirit and in truth. That's a real personal thing. I can't pray, I can pray it for you, but it, it really only works if you pray it for you. So I want you to do that right now. Lord, help me to worship you in spirit and in truth. God, I believe I am. It's my intent and my heart, and you know my heart. It's all about my heart. Lord, to worship you, not, not because it's the way I was raised alone, not, not because it's what I know, but Lord, because it is what I believe to be the truth of how to worship the one true God. Lord, and I come before you to worship you in spirit and in truth, not of my own power and volition, but I offer myself through the blood of Jesus Christ and the, the, the direction of the Holy Spirit as a sacrifice to you, God, to worship you. In the name of Jesus Christ, hallelujah, Lord, we worship you. Help us to worship you in spirit and in truth, in Jesus' name. And the church said, amen, amen. If you have your Bibles, you'll turn with me for the next few moments. We're going to be looking at John, I believe, chapter 8 is where we're going to be looking, if I can get my Bible open. I say it like an East Texan Bible. Get my Bible open. John chapter 8. I'm going to read verses 30 through 36. How many of you want to be free? How many of you want to be free? Amen? Amen? Some of you are thinking, I'm already free. I can hear you. I'm already free. What do you mean? I want to be free. I'm already free. Well, let's look at this. Jesus spoke these words. Many believed on him. Verse 30. Then Jesus said to the Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word and you are my disciples indeed, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And they answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? And Jesus answered them, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever. But a son, everybody say a son, abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, I thank you and I praise you. For your goodness and for your mercy, Lord, for your loving kindness. Lord, I pray, God, that you would open our hearts and our ears to hear what the Spirit is speaking to us through your word today. I pray that we would receive the seed of your word, that it would be uh, find good, fallow ground, that it would germinate and produce fruit in our lives that would, through faith and your spirit, and it would glorify and honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So Jesus is talking to these Jews who are hearing him preach. They're hearing him, according to John, they believed on what he was saying. He was teaching, he was preaching, he was instructing. And it's not just his di disciples who are following him. There's, there's, there's a lot of different uh, people from different cultures. Because Jesus, man, he was the best cross-cultural uh, minister the world has ever seen. He really has, because he, he reached the Samaritans. He, he ministered to a Syrophoenician woman. I mean, only because she had faith, but I mean, you know, because he said what was needed to be said. You know, with the Syrophoenician woman, she came and said, Lord, would you heal my daughter? A Syrophoenician woman, she was a Gentile person who came to Jesus and asked him to do something for her. And in that moment, Jesus was not 
come to minister to the Gentiles. He had come to minister to the Jews. And then the Jewish people were going to be the light to the rest of the world. We see that in the New Testament church. And primarily the New Testament church in its beginning were, were Jewish believers who had converted from Jew, Judaism to Christianity. And then Paul, primarily through Paul and Barnabas and those, they spread the gospel to the Gentile nations. And, and, you, and, and we're here because of the Gentile church that believed. But Jesus was encountered, or he encountered a woman who came to him and said, I want you to do for me what you're doing for these. And, and at first, Jesus didn't even talk to her. He didn't say anything. He just, he went about his business. Because he, he, it wasn't her time. He hadn't come for that. Sounds harsh. Sounds really, you know, abrasive. But he knew what his purpose was, and he was staying in that lane. And she pressed him, and she said, oh, but Lord, I need you to do it. And he looks at her, and he said, it's not meat, or it's not allowed for me to take food from the table to give to the dogs. Now if you don't think. That would put you in your place. Because he just called her a dog. Fear, yeah she was a Syrophoenician. But she didn't let it go. I don't know if you've ever met. Ed, I'm not going to say it's because it's a woman. Because I've met men like this too. Just won't let it go. I, I have a son. I won't tell you which one it was. But, but growing up, when he became a teen, teenager, he didn't know when to stop. Because in our home, we allowed some discussion about things they didn't agree with. They could, they could disagree, but they had to have an understanding that there's a point where you just need to stop because dad says, that's it. I don't have to have a reason. I'm dad. If I say no, that's what it is. And there came a point when one of my sons, he just kept pushing and kept pushing. And I looked at him, I said... You're going to have to learn to say, you're going to have to learn when to shut your mouth or you're going to wind up in some really deep trouble. Well, that took him back because I, you know, he was real bold, but he didn't know that I was going to be that bold talking back. I said, I don't mind you questioning and asking questions doing that. I wasn't allowed that in my home, but I don't mind you doing that as long as you understand I'm the dad and what I say goes in the end. And when I say no, that means no. Okay, this woman didn't get it because Jesus said no real harshly. He said, I'm not allowed to take meat from the table and feed it to the dog. She didn't argue the point that she was a dog. She said, you're right, Lord. But even the dogs get to eat of the crumbs under the master's table. And Jesus stops and he turns and he looks at her and he says, I've not seen this kind of faith in all of Israel. And he does for her what she asks. cross-cultural ministry okay he's talking to and all these jews are believing all these jews are hearing all these jews are believing and so he looks at him and he says because they're believing the bible uses the word they believed what he said and then he says now if you really want to be free because you know there's there's the entry level of serving jesus and then there's deeper levels of serving jesus and how many of you know? How many of you know? No matter where you're at, there's always a new level. Paul put it this way. I haven't arrived. I haven't arrived. I wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, and he said, I haven't arrived yet. I'm not where I need to be yet. We should always be striving. And so Jesus spoke to these Jews, and he said, if you really want to be free, and they became indignant. What do you mean, free? What, what, what do you mean free? We're, we're seed of Abraham. We've never been in bondage. Well, they were lying out their ears. They'd been in bondage. Uh, they were in bondage in Egypt. They were in bondage when they came into the land of Canaan because over and over, the, the Philistines, the Assyrians, you name it, God raised up uh, Hittites and Amor, all these different nations that they didn't fully run out or the Babylonians who came in because they were sinning and they put them into bondage. They were 400 years in Egypt. They were 70 years in Babylon. They were under bondage. When they came back, they were still in this moment under Roman rule. They were under bondage. 
You know what it means to be in bondage? It means you can't freely move about. There's restrictions. There are things that are inhibiting you. You know, you, you can, we could talk all about this differently from a lot of different angles. There are people in bondage in the church to things that inhibit them from walking in the fullness of their faith in Jesus Christ. And Jesus is saying to us today, just like he said to them, if you really want to be free. And we get bent out of shape because we don't want to admit that sometimes we're not really free. We don't want to admit that sometimes we're in bondage to things that we've allowed us to, to, to get in bondage to. And oh Lord, help me not to be too harsh right here. Okay? I talked about it a little Sunday. It don't matter what day we worship on. Sometimes we get in, into bondage to the traditions that we've set up. Or ideas, or our thoughts, the way things ought to be. I have an idea of the way I think things ought to be. Most of the time, it don't line up with God's way. It, because God's way is above ours. He, he's above us. He says, if you will continue in my word, believing is not enough. In James chapter 2, verse 19, it talks about how the, the devils believe and tremble. But to truly believe, he says, you have to continue. That word uh, continue means to abide, to stay, to live in. And so he says, you are my disciples if you abide or you continue in my word. It means that we're following him. Uh, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you'll ask what you will and it will be done unto you. Um, 2 Timothy. I want, if you have your Bible, turn there with me. 2 Timothy. Because I want to show you something. I don't know how you are with your Bibles. I, I've, I've got several. I have a Bible on my desk that I've preached for, out of the last 20 years. And I wanted a new Bible, and Gina and Zoe, Zoe got me a new Bible for Father's Day. It's the one I've been preaching out of since Father's Day. But it's not broke in. You know what that means? It means I don't know how to get to where I'm going yet. Because <laughs> I haven't used it enough. I don't, I, don't, I don't use this for my Bible study. I have a, I have a different Bible at home that I, and, and this goes with me in my backpack. If you see me have, carry my backpack, this is with me. It's always in my Bible or my backpack. But I, I only use it on Sundays. Um, I'll mark it. It hasn't been marked up yet. But I've got one. It's got a lot of notes and a lot of things um, that I'll use for my daily Bible study at home. And then I've got one that I use here if I'm in the office for studying. I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'd be ashamed to tell you how many Bibles I have. <laughs> Probably 10 or more. Um, and, and some of them are well-worn and some of them, and that's not counting my grandmother's Bible and my grandfather's Bible and my dad's Bible that sit on the shelf because if I were to use them, they would fall apart. They're that worn, okay? So I was looking for Second Timothy. It was taking me a little while. I'm like, man, I got to start using this more than just preaching because I can't find what I'm looking for. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 says, But know this, in the last days, everybody say last days. In the last days, I believe we're there. Of course, they believed that in, in the day of Paul when he wrote this. He thought they were in the last days. Know this, in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control. Brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but de denying its power, and from such people turn away. For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women 
loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now look at 2 Timothy chapter uh, 4, verses 3 and 4. 2 Timothy 4, verse 3. He says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Verse 5, he says, But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, and fulfill your ministry. So Jesus told them, in John chapter 8, he said, you, you got to abide. You got to stay there. It, it, it gives the, the, the picture or the implication that we follow along wherever he takes us, wherever he goes. He says, if you abide in me, if you abide in my words, then you are my disciples. If you're, if you're abiding, 1 John 3 and 6 says, Whosoever abides in him sins not, and whoever sins has not seen him, neither has known him. And then Jesus goes on to say, You shall know the truth. Everybody say the truth. The truth. We, we did a whole series for a couple of months on the truth on Sunday mornings. Truth is not what you think it is, and it's not what I think it is. It's not our definition. Truth is what God says. It's not what the government says. It's not what your boss says. It's not what your mom or dad says. The truth is what God says. And we're only in truth as we line up with what God says. That's that's the cold reality or the, the, the plain fact of the situation. You shall know the truth. Now that word know in, in, in that passage of Scripture, it indicates it's, it's the same usage of a man knowing a woman. It implies intimacy. And deeper than just, just knowing my name. And it's deeper than just having a casual relationship. And it's deeper than just, just being able to identify me on sight. It is having an intimate relationship with the person that you know. It's having, that, that's what he's saying. You shall know the truth. And in order for you and I to know the truth, we've got to have an intimate relationship with God. And I know I talked about this some last week, uh, and we're on a different topic, but uh, the Holy Spirit just keeps driving this home in my spirit. We've got to know Him. We've got to know who He is. Not, Not from the standpoint of, yeah, I know who God is. Does anybody in here have more than a thousand friends on Facebook? I don't know if I do. I think I've got three or four hundred. Okay, nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. That's you're you're connecting. You're making connections. That's not a bad thing, especially with the ministry that you have and in music and wanting to go and sing. And that's not a bad thing. I don't have that many friends. I, it's not that I don't have people asked to be my friend, but if I don't know them. I'm probably not going to friend them. I, my daughter-in-law, one of my daughter-in-laws, she's just the opposite. Of course, again, she has business and she's looking for connections to, to, to do her business and that kind of thing. And so I get that. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not putting that down. I'm just saying. And on my Facebook page, I think I've got four or 500, maybe at the, at, at the max, I've got 500 friends, Facebook friends. And of those Facebook friends, there's a lot of them that I could identify on site, but I don't really know them. If you ask me, do I trust them? I'd say, well, I don't know. <laughs> That's a different story. You know, we had our grandkids here for a, a, a week and a half. In our new house, we have a swimming pool. And, and uh, Jude, he was constantly saying, he said, I'm going to do a trust fall. I'm like, what? I'm going to do a trust fall. And he would back up to the edge of the pool, right at the edge of the pool and fall into the water. And I'm like, that's not a trust fall. You know that the water's there. You know you're going to hit the water. You're just falling backwards out of the water. A trust fall is when you're going to fall and it would injure you if someone didn't catch you and you're trusting that they would catch you. I get it. He was, he's five and he was having a good time. And he was like, big Paul, big Paul, I want to see you do a trust fall. And I'm thinking, you just want to see a big splash. That's what you're looking for. You're just looking to see Big Paul, Big Paul hurt his back or something like that. That's what you're looking for. It was all into this trust fall. And I thought, who do we really trust and on what level? 
You see, if we're going to trust, we've got to know God. It's difficult to trust someone that you haven't known. Now, I know that life sometimes puts us in situations where we have to. You've ever flown a plane? Or actually flown in a plane, not flown a plane. Because I'm going to tell you, if they told me to get on the plane and I saw you in the captain's seat, I'd probably disembark immediately. Because I have no faith that you know what you're doing. But if I see a captain that I don't know and he's got the wings and he's got the hat or she and, and I have trust and confidence in, in the airlines and the government, everybody's supposed to be taking care of our safety, that they know what they're doing and I can sit back there. Do I pray when the plane takes off? I do. Do I play, pray when it lands? More than when it takes off. But I still trust them. I have a level of faith to believe that they are capable of doing the job that they're doing to get us off the ground safely and back down safely. Or I wouldn't have bought the ticket. Some of that faith comes from my experience. Because I've flown before. I've ridden on airplanes. Not only that, I took some flying lessons when I was 19, 20 years old. Now to say that I could fly a plane, I would be telling a story. To say that I might could bring one down in an emergency, there's no doubt I could bring it down. Whether we survived or not is the question. <laughs> you see, there's a trust issue right there. I wanted to go back and get my license, and, and, and I told Gina, we can, we can travel this way. And she looked at me like, oh, I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, you know, because I, I, I'm a fan of Tim Allen and, and home, you know, home Alone or Home, no, no, Tool Time. And I felt like she said, I don't think so, Tim. You know, like Al used to do. I don't think so. Uh, you know, she, I'll watch you take off and I'll watch you land. I said, well, I could take the boys up because we didn't have Joey, Zoe at the time. She's like, I don't think so. You know. So, you know, even if we're going to trust God, we've got to know who he is. And the only way we can do that is by knowing his word. And Jesus said, you will know the truth. Okay? That's his word. So when John, in John chapter 16 and verse 13, Jesus says this. He says, when the spirit, he, the spirit of truth, has come. Now, the Holy Spirit is called the spirit of truth. When he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of himself, but whatever he hears, that will he speak, and he will show you things to come. And so we understand and know that the Holy Spirit is not here to speak of himself. He is the spirit of truth to speak of the things of Christ. John chapter 14, verse 6, he says, I am the way. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father except by me. If you abide in me, you will know the truth. This is what Jesus said in John 8. If you abide in me, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Romans 8 and 2. Actually, 8, 1 and 2. I'm going to read it. I have it written down here, but I want to read it. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. Chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but walk according to the Spirit. Verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Now see, there's two laws being talked about, the law of life and the law of death. The law of the flesh, which leads to death, or the law of life. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Okay? So in, in Romans 8, verses 1 and 2, we're told by Paul that it is through the law. Now he was dealing with people who were converting from following the law to following Christ. And they had difficulty understanding. Can I tell you, in the Pentecostal world, there is a group of believers within the Pentecostal realm who struggle with the law. Ah, uh, yeah. 
fixing to pull the covers off that one. You see, the law, the law says thus and thus and thus. That's what the law says. But grace says you're forgiven. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not Calvinist. Okay? I don't believe you can just sin and sin and sin and sin and sin and never repent and, and just because you said a prayer one time that you're going to heaven no matter what you do. I don't believe in that. I do believe that there is occasion of backsliding. It's a willful turning away of, from Jesus Christ. In fact, it's saying I don't want to follow Christ anymore. I don't believe what he's done is for me. But falling into sin, falling into temptation as a believer is not backsliding. And if you get up and you wash yourself off with the water of the word and repentance and confession and you move forward, that's not backsliding. Backsliding, you see, that's falling. There's a difference in falling and backsliding. And if I fall because I failed and I've yielded to temptation, I'm not going backwards. But if I turn and walk away from this, then I'm, I'm, I'm going backwards. I'm, I'm sliding back. Now, Jesus talks about in John chapter 8, and I'm running out of time. And I'm getting deep. I'm digging a hole deeper than I expected. Jesus talks about something in John chapter 8 toward the end of what we, what we read, 30 through 36. He said, if you serve sin, you're, you're a slave to sin. And you have, no, you have no recourse. But then he goes on to talk about being a son. He said, a son remains. John chapter 8. Okay? I'm going to read it. Just, just to refresh our memory. In John 8, in verse 34, he says, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin, and a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Now, I want you to, to understand the usage of son in those two sentences right there are different. The one he uses in the last part, he's referring to himself. The one he uses in the first part, he's referring to those who come into the family of God. You understand we are called the sons and daughters of God because we are an heir and a joint heir with Christ Jesus. That puts us in the relationship with God on not, not the same level of, of having the power and authority, although we do have the power and authority of Christ, but we're not the only begotten son, but we are sons of God, daughters of God. We do belong to him. Now watch this. Watch this. Because there are people that struggle with this all the time. They have difficulty. If I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I confess him with my mouth. I believe in my heart. He accepts me into the family. God brings me in. He welcomes me. And I'm walking on my way. I am living my life according to what I know and believe is what the Word says. And I hit a rough spot. You know what a rough spot is? It's sin. It's a temptation. And I give in to that temptation. Back in the day when I was a kid, we thought God had a pencil and an eraser and He was blotting your name out. Anybody remember those days? They preached it so hard you couldn't live it. You'd say, what's the use? What I think they didn't understand or realize is that at some point, if you abide in him, you go from a servant of God the Father, Christ, to a son. Now, don't ask me what that point is. I, I don't fully know everything about the Bible. I do know this, that Paul talked about that we are waiting for the completion of the adoption. Because we're not Jewish, we weren't blood born of the, the, the seed of Abraham, but we're told by Paul in his writings that if we are in Christ, we are 
grafted into the vine. So we are the same as the seed in the spiritual sense and in the physical sense. That's why we can believe for the promises from the front and the, of this book to the back of this book. But here's, here's really what I wanted to say in this. I have three children. I have three kids. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I was the best father in the world, that there was no better father than me. I will tell you I did the best I knew how. With what I had and what I knew, I was the best father that I knew how to be. And I'll also say this, and I don't, I don't feel bashful about it. I don't know of any father, aside from God, that loves their children more than I love mine. Because I won't fight you over a lot of things, but I will fight to the, to the death over my children. Even now, one of them's thirty, going to be 38, and one of them's 31, and one of them's 21. And I would fight you on their behalf or over them. I, I'd give my life for them. I love them. They're my kids. I'm not saying I love them more than you love yours, but I'm saying you don't love yours any more than I love mine. Because I love them. They're my children. Jose, if one of them did something or said something, now, my kids have not been perfect. They're just like any other kids. Just because they're preacher's kids don't mean they didn't do things that they shouldn't have done. And they had their share of mistakes, and then they did their share of things that they shouldn't have done. But, but nothing that would have shocked me to the end of being shocked. But even if they had done something completely out of line or character with what I believed, I may have been disappointed. I may have spoke to them with a hard line at times. But never, ever would I say, you're not my son or you're not my daughter. There's nothing, there's nothing in, in, that I can conceive that they could do that would make me to say, you're not mine. Now, if, if, if a human person can have that kind of feeling, how much greater is God's toward us? And Jesus, we're talking about being free. Jesus said, listen, if you'll abide, if you'll abide in what I say, if you'll live in what I say, if you'll follow what I say, you'll be free. Because you'll know the truth, and that will set it will make you free. It will set you free. There's nothing more liberating than knowing the truth. Because it's when you know the truth, you can cast off the lies. You can cast off the preconceived notions of what you thought was right and wrong or what you thought was true. And you can have a, an epiphany of what God said. And this is the line in the sand. This is what he said is true. The truth will set you free. The truth will set you free. truth will set you free. Now let me tell you something about the truth. Because we all have truth. I've done things in my past that's the truth. I ain't about to tell you what they are. Ain't none of your business. The, nest, the need for the truth for me was so that I could recognize that I was lost and that I was in sin and I can confess and meet a Savior who wanted to set me free. Now, there's nothing wrong with testifying. If you want to testify where God brought you from, that's fine. You need to testify. You need to tell people. It ought to be part of your personal testimony of what God has done for you. But I'm going to tell you, there's things you might not ought to share. I don't know. I don't know your story. But I'm going to tell you this. Knowing the truth will set you free. Your truth. I don't need to know your truth. I need to know my truth. When I say my truth, I need to know the truth of Jesus Christ and how it applies to my life. 
and how it changes my direction and what it can do for me in my circumstance. How it can take me from sinful to saved, sanctified, and full of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to say this, I'm going to close. The, and, I've, and I've said this before, in the, in, I've been here in, in October, it'll be my, we'll be finishing six years in October. We'll be. I've talked about justification before. Anybody know what it means to be justified? Raise your hand. Okay, say it. I heard somebody say it. Okay, all right, yeah. Did I teach you that or did someone else? Okay, I thought I had. It's just as if I'd never sinned because we are justified by the blood of Jesus Christ. When we get saved, it's just as if we're never, we'd never sinned. We're a new creature. We're, we're a new creation. I, I was teaching a CAMS class this last Saturday in Weatherford. We had 16 people. Big class. We're doing it in person. I'm so glad we're doing it in person. I talked about justification. These are people who are wanting to be ministers. Some of them are already ministering at their churches. And I said something about justification in one of my seminars. And it was like they, their faces went blank. They'd never heard the word. It's in our minutes. It, it's in our statement of faith. We believe in justification. And, and are, are we raising a generation that doesn't know that they need to be justified? Because <laughs> you need to be justified. What that justification means, it's just as if I'd never sinned. I'm a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things become new. And if I abide in the word, there comes a moment where I transition from a servant to a son. And I want to tell you, that's what you need to be looking for. I'm going to ask you to stand. You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Father, in the name of